Well, welcome everyone. Uh, we're so glad that you're here today. Glory to God, right? Glory to God. Praise his name. I want to say hello to everyone that's uh, joining on us online today. I have a, a special message that I believe God has uh, put on my heart and uh, just excited to share it with you today. It's uh, about uh, holiness. Uh, before I jump into that, though, uh, I want to let you know uh, that we, you know, we put a lot of work into uh, services uh, to worship God, uh, not so that people uh, walk away and say, you know, oh, that was good. Uh, we do it so that God would look down and say, that was good. You know, those people worship me and they love me and yeah, that's right, Les. There you go. I like that up front. All right. Amen. Yeah, that deserves a, a, a clap. And I want to do thank uh, all, all the people that have worked so hard to get here today. And of course, next week is the, um, is the grand opening at 11 o'clock. And so you guys should be on time because you're the 11 AMers, right? It's the 931s that we're worried about. So now they'll uh, hopefully be here. There's going to be an open house between 930 and 1030, and you're going to get to go wherever you want. You can come up backstage, look around the back, see all the things, and it'll be fun uh, from 930 to 1030. And then at 11 o'clock, we're all going to gather uh, together. We have a very special service plan next week, uh, going to be very, very powerful. Uh, we want you to know uh, there will be a cross in this worship center, and yeah, it's going to be unveiled in a very special way uh, next Sunday morning. We kind of wanted to hold off on that, and, and it's going to be a part of uh, the opening of the service. So you want to be in here at 11 o'clock. You don't want to miss the unveiling uh, of the cross. It's going to be, be very powerful, so uh, we're, we're hope you're there. And then, again, as Andy said, it was beautiful. Uh, in the morning, uh, first service, as people had lined uh, uh, the altar here, and we're just praying, and it was a, a beautiful sight, and who knows, that may happen again uh, at the end of uh, our time to, together. And so I want to open up today with a story, Matthew 9, 20 to 11. If you want to open up your Bibles, I have it on the screen for you. And if you've been watching The Chosen, uh, this is one of my favorite scenes of The Chosen uh, this season. Uh, it's about this woman uh, that is uh, suffering from bleeding. She's been bleeding uh, for 12 years, and uh, most of us are adults in the room, so we're not going to get into that. Um, if you have children, you can have that discussion later. We're not going to have that discussion uh, this morning. Thanks, Pastor Dan, for bringing that up, right? Matthew 9, 20 to 22 but just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding uh, for 12 years uh, came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. So here's Jesus walking through a crowd, and here's this woman that's been subject to bleeding for 12 years, and she comes up behind him and touches the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, so she's saying this to herself in her mind, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. You know, what faith, you know, imagine if, if Jesus was here this morning, how many of you would say, if I could just come up and touch him, I, I have the faith that I, I would be healed. Well, Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. So at that very moment, this woman is healed from what she has been subject to for 12 years. This has everything to do with what we call holiness because we believe in holiness. You may be asking, what does that really have to do with holiness? Well, I hope I can explain it to you this morning because it really does have everything to do with what we call holiness. Holiness. Now, what is holiness? There are two words that are used in the Bible, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, that mean holiness. The Old Testament word is uh, the Hebrew word kadash. Everyone say kadash. Kadash. All right, so that's kadash. And then the Greek word is hagios. Say hagios. All right, so you just said holiness, uh, sanctification, really interchangeable words. And so what these words mean is to be sacred. Set apart, set far apart, different from uh, the world. And so a metaphor that could help us out with this is the sun. The sun is set apart. The sun is very different from the world. And in that way, the sun can be sacred. And even the area around the sun is set apart. The sun is the source of life for our planet. If we didn't have the sun, we wouldn't be here. 
The sun is very powerful, and it's very beautiful. And in Ohio, when the clouds finally part and we see the sun, we are happy, right? (laughs) We are happy. Amen. I knew that would get an amen. Beautiful. But if we were to all jump in a spaceship this morning, and we were to travel towards the sun... As we approach the sun, the sun would become very dangerous. In fact, if we got too close to the sun, we would all die. And that's the paradox of God's holiness. God's holiness is the source of all life. God's holiness is beautiful. God's holiness is very powerful. But the paradox is, is it's very dangerous. Because if you got too close to the holiness of God, you would die. You couldn't bear the holiness of God. In fact, the high priest, when he would go into the Holy of Holies, they would tie a rope around his legs. He would be wearing bells because if he was not ready to be in the presence of God, he would fall over dead. (laughs) And they would pull him out with the rope. And so anyone that was in proximity to the holiness of God, wow, they were in danger. And we see this with Moses, that God's holiness is actually dangerous. We see this in Moses when God is talking to Moses through a burning bush, you know? The Bible, just read the Bible, try it. There's some interesting things in there. And so here's a burning bush, right? And God is speaking through this burning bush. And Moses approaches the bush in Exodus 3, 5. And this is what God says to him. Do not come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing. It is is holy ground. (laughs) It's holy ground. In other words, Moses, it's dangerous if you get any closer. Moses is leaning into God's holiness, and as he's getting closer to God's holiness, it is radiating, and God says, stop right now. Don't come any closer. Take off your sandals before, before where you are is, is holy ground. <laughs> and so we, we see this image, we see this picture move with the people of God to the temple period, where where. God's people build this temple, and the temple is where God's holiness is. And and so if you were around the temple in proximity to to the temple, how did you deal with this dangerous holiness of God? Well, the only answer to deal with this was to be pure, to be morally pure. I think we all get that, the Ten Commandments, do our best to obey the laws and commands of God to be morally pure. But there was this other purity. It was called ritual purity. And ritual purity meant that you could touch things that would make you unclean. And if you were unclean, then you couldn't be in the presence of God. And so the book of Leviticus, that's another book, you should check that out sometime. The whole book of Leviticus is God telling his people what makes you unclean. And if you're unclean, what you need to do to become clean. So if you were ritually impure or unclean, it didn't mean you were sinful. It just mean maybe you had touched someone that had a skin disease. Or maybe you had been around a dead corpse. Or maybe you were bleeding. And if you were bleeding, there were things you needed to do to become pure again. And so again, the issue wasn't bleeding or touching something that was dead or touching someone that had a disease. It was you needed to take care of that before you could go back into the proximity or the closeness of the holiness of God. (laughs) Are you following me? So the temple was all about purity. In Leviticus 19.2, God says, hey, Moses, speak to the entire assembly of Israel. Bring everybody together. This is so important that every single person needs to hear this and say this to them. Be holy. Be holy. Because I, the Lord your God, am holy. So be separate. Be different from the world. Be sacred. Do not let yourself be morally or ritually unclean or impure and dare to come into my presence. Because if you come into my holiness that way, it will be dangerous. So then we move forward about 600-ish years (laughs) to the prophet Isaiah. In 
Isaiah is having a vision. And Isaiah is a man of unclean lips. He is impure, he is unclean. And in this vision, he finds himself in the temple of God. And he knows he shouldn't be there. He knows that he is in trouble because he is unclean. And then this mystical, holy animal comes flying. It's a crazy looking animal. The Bible describes this animal. And this animal has this, this small stone. If you imagine the sun that we look at, just bring it down to a stone that could be held in the hand and this stone is glowing. And here's what happens in Isaiah 6, 7. With it, he touched my mouth, Isaiah says, and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And what we see here with the holiness of God is something we have never seen before. We see transformation. Because typically, when you are dirty or when you are unclean and you touch something that is pure, you make that thing dirty. Let me illustrate it for you. You've cleaned your house. You got it all clean. Maybe you've painted a wall. The wall is freshly painted. And then here come the children. The children come into the house. And they begin to mess up your clean house. And you're telling your children, would you quit doing this? Would you put your, I just cleaned. Mothers, how many times? I just cleaned this place. Now look at it. What happened? The dirty kids came in and made what was clean unclean. And then you got that wall painted. I mean, you spent all kinds of time painting that wall. The wall looks beautiful. It's freshly painted. You're admiring it. Then the kids come off the playground. And what do you know? As soon as they see that wall, they take that dirty, grimy hand, and they walk down that wall just putting their hand on the whole thing. And you want to kill them. Why does that happen? Because what is dirty always makes the clean unclean. It doesn't work the other way around. We wish it would, but it doesn't work that way. So when you're dusting and you got that clean rag and you run it over that countertop, when you look at the clean rag, what happened? It got dirty. But here, the dirty, here, the unclean comes into the clean, comes into the pure, and something different happens this time. Now this pure, holy stone touches these unclean lips and makes the lips clean. And we read the guilt has been taken away and your sin atoned for. Then we go to the vision of Ezekiel. The vision of Ezekiel. Later, Ezekiel, the prophet, has this vision, and it's the same thing of this temple, this holy of holies, this place where the holiness of God is. And now, this vision sees water flowing from underneath the threshold of the temple, and the water is pouring out from underneath the threshold, flowing out of the holy of holies. And it forms this stream, and it goes into this desert land, and as this stream travels into this desert land, green starts growing, and trees start growing, and everything this river touches begins to come to life. And then this river flows into the Dead Sea, salt water, where there's nothing that is living. And then when this water gets into the Dead Sea, the salt water is turned to fresh water. And the Dead Sea comes to life, and fish begin to swim, and there's new life and new hope. This water that is flowing out is now bringing life where there was death. And we scratch our heads. And we ask ourselves, well, what does this all mean, the vision of Ezekiel? What does this mean, the the vision of Isaiah? What does this mean with the purity of the temple? What does this mean, Moses? Take your sandals off, for you are standing on holy ground. And then there's 400 years of silence. 400 years where God does not speak. And then this man named Jesus of Nazareth comes walking on the scene. And he, and he embodies holiness. He embodies holiness. And in John 7, 38, he says this, whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And if we jump back to Ezekiel, where this vision, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple and saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple. And we go to Jesus where he says, whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, what's he referring to? Ezekiel, 
a scripture said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. So now, Jesus says, I am the embodiment of holiness. And I now am going to make my residence within you. And whoever decides to follow me, streams of living water will flow from within them. And when you understand holiness and all of the Old Testament and how it builds up and Jesus says, now I am the fulfillment of this. It's so much more powerful than if you just say, oh, I believe in holiness. (laughs) Because this was always God's plan. That holiness wouldn't be this thing that was way out there and we had to purify ourselves just to try to get into the presence of holiness. No, that holiness would come and holiness would touch us and make us pure, make the unclean clean and make the impure pure. And Jesus would say this, I must leave so the Holy Spirit can come and the Holy Spirit will baptize you (laughs) with fire. He will cleanse the impurities. He will cleanse the unholiness and fill us with his holy presence. (laughs) So, are you bleeding? Are you bleeding? And with the understanding of all that I just shared with you, Let's read through Luke's account of this woman who was bleeding and see if it doesn't make more sense to you than the first time we read it. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. No one could heal her. People never change, right? People stay the same. We've all experienced this. We have people that we love and they have these behaviors that they just keep doing over and over again. We hurt for them. We struggle with them because it just seems like they can't shake that thing. They're bleeding. And it seems that no one can heal them. (laughs) We may struggle with things ourselves. There's patterns of behavior in our lives and We go through these seasons where we know we're doing things that aren't pleasing to the Lord and we ask God to forgive us but we have this sinking feeling that we're probably going to return to that behavior in a couple weeks and we'll have to ask God to forgive us again. (laughs) We're saved, we've trusted Jesus as our savior but there are these patterns of behaviors that we just can't shake and it's like we can't change. We're bleeding and no one has been able to heal us. Well, she came up behind him and and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. (laughs) Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. (laughs) And so this unclean woman, this ritually unclean and impure woman, she was fighting through this crowd, and she was touching other people and making them unclean. (laughs) And so she was going through this crowd, making all these people unclean. She was typically away by herself in an isolated place. But here she is. She is so desperate to be healed. She is so desperate for the holiness of Jesus to touch her that she doesn't care who she makes unclean. She doesn't care who she touches. And Peter's confused. There's so many people here, Jesus. What do you mean, who touched me? But Jesus said, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. And if you understand the vision of Isaiah, if you understand the vision of Ezekiel, then you understand what Jesus is saying. That Jesus came and he touched the person with the skin skin disease. Jesus came and he touched the dead body. Jesus came and he touched the one that was bleeding. And his purity was not corrupted. His purity did not become dirty. No, when Jesus touched the unclean, the unclean became clean. When Jesus touched the impure, the impure became pure because Jesus had a holiness, a powerful, dangerous holiness that sin would run from, that disease and sickness would run from. And when Jesus touched you, oh, things changed. And so if you understand holiness in the Old Testament, you understand the vision and and the progression of it all, you understand why Jesus said, the power has gone out from me. I felt it. 
Because just like that stone touched the lips of Isaiah, now the, the garment of Jesus, this woman touched it, and the power went out. Then the woman, seeing that she could go unnoticed, oh, see, this is us. This is us. We want his holiness, but we want to go unnoticed. We want his holiness. We want his power in our lives. We want to be healed, but we don't want anybody to know about it. We don't want to tell anybody. We want to be opaque. We don't want to be transparent. But it's not how it works. It's not why, how it worked for her. It's not how it works for us. <laughs> and when she finally saw that she could not go unnoticed, she came trembling and, and she fell at his feet. And in the presence of all the people, everyone's eyes open, everyone seeing, everyone knowing that she was the woman that was bleeding for 12 years and they knew they had touched, she had been touched, they touched, she touched them and they had made them unclean. <laughs> In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Oh, and this is the best part. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. And here's the best news. No matter how dirty you are, no matter how unclean you are, no matter how impure that part of your life is, Jesus can touch you and heal you and make you clean and bring you peace. But it's not going to happen in secret. It's not going to happen in secret. It's not how Jesus works. It's not how holiness works. So what's the next step? I was bleeding. I was bleeding, but no one knew I was bleeding. And I was at Olivet Nazarene University and I was sitting in a chapel service. And I was bleeding because I did not want to obey the call of God on my life. I knew God was calling me to the ministry and I was resisting it. I was being disobedient to it and I was bleeding. I had no peace. And I remember a preacher was up there preaching about holiness a preacher was preaching about surrendering it all to Jesus. He was telling me how I couldn't straddle the fence anymore. Anyone ever try to straddle a barbed wire fence? It's not good. I grew up on a farm. I know an electrical fence. I know a barbed wire fence. You want to be on one side of the fence or the other. You do not want to be straddling that fence. But that's how I was. I had one foot that wanted to follow Jesus, but I had the other foot that wanted to follow the things of the world. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to be rich. I wanted to be powerful and, and famous. I wanted to do things that were fun. I didn't want to follow the call of God in my life. What would that mean? What would my future be? And I was bleeding. I was bleeding. But I needed the holiness of God. I needed to surrender all to God. I needed to be sanctified through and through. I needed my life to be set apart, to be different from the world. That's what God was calling me to do. But I was resisting it with everything that I had in my being. But there was a crisis moment. I knew in that moment, in that chapel service, if I did not obey God in that moment, I might not get a second chance. It was a crisis, and I knew it. And some of you are here this morning, and that's where you are. You're bleeding. I don't know what you're bleeding over. I don't know if it's over money. I don't know if it's over lust. I don't know if it's over some addiction. I don't know if it's over greed. I don't know if it's over self-centeredness. I don't know what it is, but you are bleeding. And this morning is a crisis moment. This morning is a moment where you're going to be making a decision. 
Are you going to chase the world and and chase Jesus and try to straddle the fence? Or are you going to go all in for Jesus like this woman? And you don't care who notices. You don't care who's looking. You are so desperate to be healed from this pattern of behavior you found yourself in that you are willing to step out of your seat and come down before a holy God and ask him to touch you and make you clean and make you pure. And heal the brokenness that is in you. I stepped out. I stepped out of my seat. I walked down that aisle. That room was huge. It was way bigger than this. I had to walk a long ways. But I didn't care. I didn't care anymore. It didn't matter what my future was going to be. It didn't matter what my life was going to be. I was going to follow the call of God on my life. That was going to be number one. And when I got down to that altar, I was in tears. I surrendered it all. And the holiness of God filled me and changed me and transformed me. And it's why I'm here today. Does that happen once, Pastor Dan? No. Holiness requires a daily surrender. But there are also these significant moments in our lives where Jesus calls us to either be healed or stay where we are. The second time this happened was right here in Canton, Ohio. I'd been six years coaching football at Malone University. I knew God was calling me to pastoral ministry, and I did not want to leave college football. But I was driving down here, 62, off this ramp, and in that car, on that ramp, coming off of uh, Cleveland Avenue onto 62, God came into that car, his holiness came into that car, and I've told this story over and over again, because no one else was in the car with me other than the Holy Spirit. But I am not ashamed to say, in that moment, I knew that I knew that I had to give up college football and pursue pastoral ministry. Little did I know, a brother by the name of Jose, who's here this morning, God spoke to him right outside on 62 on this church and said, there's a pastor in that church that needs encouragement for the next three years because there's things happening. He didn't even know what's happening. Made for more, this vision for the future. You need to encourage that pastor. I didn't even know you are gonna be here, Jose. But you need to encourage that pastor for the next uh, three years and really forevermore. Jose asked, when is this assignment done, God? And God said, never. You gotta encourage that guy for the rest of your life. Sorry, Jose. But what I'm telling you, why I'm telling you that is because if God calls you, he will equip you, he will provide people for you, he will do everything that you need to get over the thing that you're bleeding. So it's time to settle it. It's time to settle it. Settle it. That's the next step. Settle it. Settle it. I, I, listen, everybody. <laughs> There's a time, there's a time when you got to settle some things. You got to settle it. Enough's enough. And if God is speaking to you right now, you don't know if you're going to have another opportunity. If his Holy Spirit is calling you to holiness this morning, you don't know if you're going to get the call again. Settle it. I came into my office this morning, sat down at my desk, Open up my Bible. Have you ever done this? I need a word from you this morning, Lord. Lord, I need a word from you. And you just kind of open it up. I open up my Bible this morning. And where I open up my Bible, I didn't have my bookmark there. Nothing was there. I literally just threw that thing open, looked down. And the verse that I'm about to put up on this screen that was already here, it was here at the beginning of the week, is the exact same verse that when I opened up my Bible, it was there. There's a lot of pages in the Bible, a lot of places I could have opened to. That gave me confirmation that this morning we are right on track and that there are people here today that need to experience the holiness of God. You're at a crisis moment. You need to step out of your seat. You need to come down here and you need to surrender all, whatever it is, and ask for his holiness to heal you and touch you. Here's the verse, (laughs) Isaiah 118. Come now, let us settle the matter. God said, come on now, you're here. I'm speaking to you. Why are you gonna wait? 
Let's settle it. Let's settle it. I can heal you. You're bleeding. If I just can touch your robe, Jesus. Let's settle it. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Don't let me do your laundry. Your whites will be pink. If I do it, I'll mess it up. But God says, I know how to do laundry. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. No matter how dirty you are, no matter how unclean you are, God can forgive you and make you clean, make you pure. His holiness can reside in you. And that was the vision of God from the beginning. And that's why when Jesus came, he said, people that follow me, streams of living water will flow from them. My holiness will reside in you. The Holy Spirit will be in you. And that's why Paul, when he's writing letters, he says, how can you unite yourself with a prostitute when the Holy Spirit is in you, you are forcing Jesus into prostitution when you are sexually immoral. God, help us. So I, I don't know what it is. Is it pornography? Is it stealing? Is it dishonesty? Is it greed? Is it self-centeredness? Is it abuse? Is it fits of rage? Is it anger? You keep returning to it over and over again and you need healed. You need to ask God for his holiness to sanctify you through and through. Are you desperate enough like this bleeding woman? Are you bleeding? Are you desperate enough? You don't care who sees, you don't care who knows. I need the holiness of God in my heart and in my life. Is that you today? Is that you today? Is that you? In a few moments, you're gonna have a chance to respond. I'm gonna invite you to stand. I'm gonna pray for us. The worship team's gonna come out and we're gonna sing a song that says he's worthy of it all. Heavenly Father, oh, Heavenly Father, I believe today there's some things that need settled. There are people that have come in here and for decades, for decades, they've been bleeding. And by faith, they're gonna respond this morning and say, oh Jesus, if I could just touch the hem of your garment, maybe there's hope I can be healed. And so this is nothing that I've said. This is purely the word of God and the will of God. Holy Spirit, should you choose to sanctify someone today to bring healing, I pray that in these next few moments, people will respond in obedience. I pray this in the precious name of Jesus.